Hebrews chapter 15, or chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. If you were looking for Hebrews chapter 15, you're not going to find it, okay? It's not in there. He says, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, and yet he did not sin. So, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. So let's kind of walk through this. In fact, if you're taking notes today, the notes are going to be one long sentence. So I'm going to do my best to read it as such. So if you're taking notes, we'll begin with this. Since we have a high priest who, first of all, can and will empathize with us. And we'll continue that sentence in just a second. We're very careful with this word because there's a big difference between sympathize and empathize. You see, if I'm going to sympathize with you, it simply means I don't understand what you're going through, but I can share in your sorrow. It's things for me, if I'm comforting maybe a grieving parent, if I'm comforting someone who's going through a broken relationship of some kind that I really have never gone through, what do I do as a pastor if I can't empathize with them? What do I do? I sympathize. And I try to make it really clear. I don't understand. I hope I never understand what you're going through. But you know what? There's someone who can, right? And that's what we do. But we're going to someone, unlike us, when we seek counsel, when we seek guidance, when we go to the Father, when we go to even to Jesus who goes to the Father for us, Jesus is able to empathize with anything we deal with on this earth. So, let's walk real quick through the temptation that Jesus faced. It's not on the scripture, not in your notes or anything. You can jot it down if you want to. He had the opportunity to sin, even though he didn't commit a sin. We have to be careful with that theologically. All right? The enemy was so full of pride, that is the devil, he believed that Jesus would commit a sin if he could find him at his weakest place. And he could tempt him with maybe even things that he would be tempted in. And so, you may be strong. But the enemy wants to find your weakness. He will lie in, as someone wrote one time, he will lie in wait in the grass for 40 years to just pounce on you for that one opportunity. I don't know if you've been reading much, but there's a lot of ministers out there, even some high name ministers, and you've got this Me Too movement, this hashtag Me Too. And you not only have people, celebrities who are, who are fallen prey, but you had these ministers, these people, if we're not careful, we put them on these pedestals. I mean, big names. We put them on these pedestals. We think, no way. Do you know what the enemy, you know the enemy could care less what our position is, what our status is? And so I want to get real with you this morning is that the enemy is all about not just destroying your life, but the enemy is all about destroying every life that you're connected to. So why do we pray for one another? Why do we encourage one another? We encourage one another because we truly believe that the enemy is like a lion who is out seeking who he may devour constantly so why can we be encouraged when that truth is out there we can be encouraged because jesus overcame these three temptations so understand the context is he's been out in the desert been out in the wilderness for 40 days he's been fasting which that means he's not eating for 40 days can somebody just agree that jesus was hungry all right he was hungry and so the first temptation, the devil came along and says, why don't you take those stones and just turn them into some good bread? I don't know about you. I don't know what you crave when you're hungry. I crave pretty much anything, okay? But if you're a bread eater or whatever, then that, that's pretty tempting, right? But Jesus could have done it. He could have said to that stone, become bread. He could have turned it into pizza. He could have turned it into peanut butter. He could have turned it into anything he wanted to, right? A porterhouse. Medium well. It could have been it. If I brought up enough food as we close into lunchtime for you guys, okay? He could have turned to anything, and that was a point of weakness. And what the enemy was really tempting, but it's bigger than food, what he was tempting him of is to be self-sufficient. He was trying to tempt Jesus to just take care of it on his own. And how does that relate to us? It relates to us this way. There's times in our life when we should be depending on God. We should wait on God's timing. We should wait for God. But we feel like if we can fix this problem, if we can solve this now, then we don't really need God. And we've all fallen prey to that. Maybe you have debt to prove it. Maybe you have regrets to prove it. But either way, somewhere along the lines, we've fallen prey to being self-sufficient. The second temptation was the enemy brought him up on this high temple place above the city. 
at its highest point. He said, if you'll just jump off of this thing, and right before you hit the ground, you know that you can command angels. And what will be so cool about this whole thing is these angels will swoop in and they'll rescue you. And all these people that you're wanting to follow you and your teachings, you know, when you start this thing, they'll follow you because of this great thing that you did. See, he was trying to tempt him to be spectacular. And what Jesus understood is that I don't want people to follow me because they're impressed with me and they're overwhelmed by my teachings and they're overwhelmed by the way that I look and the the power that I have of course Jesus performed miracles but it wasn't about performing miracles to draw attention to himself you know what Jesus was always doing he was always reflecting and deflecting the attention not on himself but away into his father and as he's leaving you know what he's doing he's saying I'm going to the father but there's one like me there's another one who's coming behind me the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's better than me because he can be everywhere at all times he can fill all of you instead of just being in one place at one time we're tempted to to make life just about us we're tempted to make moments just about us we're tempted to have it to where people are just looking at me if we're praying prayers just for our own praise and our own glory We're falling prey to this temptation. Third temptation was to be powerful. You see, we want prestige. We want that position. We want those titles. And the enemy came along and said, if you'll just bow to me, just take one moment and bow your knees to me. Jesus, I'll make you ruler over the world. You see, what Jesus knew is that, one, the devil didn't have that to offer. And two, in the end, he was going to win anyway. How many times do we compromise in a moment because we want to feel good, we want to feel powerful, we want that attention, we want that position, we're willing to crawl over someone, we're willing to tear somebody down, we're willing to cheat, we're willing to whatever it takes to get past and get through and to get to that position. And the enemy is all that. Don't wait for God's timing. Don't be content in the position and the power and the influence that you have. Don't wait. Just do whatever you have to do to succeed in this life. And Jesus understood, that's not the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to serve in order to lead. I'm going to die in order that others may live. And so it's a whole different perspective on this whole thing. So we serve a high priest who is Jesus, who was willing to not just face testings, but also overcome temptation. We can relate because he can relate to us. Secondly, Since we have a high priest who can and will empathize with us, if you're taking notes, welcomes us as we are. How many would admit that you watched part of the royal wedding recently? Okay, I see some ladies. I was looking for a guy's hands. Okay, okay. No man card taken. I don't know. Okay, Ryan, I see your hand. Charlie, okay. Praying for you guys. All right, praying for you. No, I'm not going to judge you. Okay. But so I, I didn't watch it, but I understand just having a conversation. Carol and I were kind of talking about this, this concept of the queen, right? I mean, you just kind of have this queen, and I would just imagine you've got the queen wave, right? And then you have this, you had to be someone to be even share the queen's presence. I mean, they just don't let anybody come to the queen. And I didn't really see anybody or hear of anybody coming to the queen and just hugging her, giving her a high five, fist pump. I mean, it's all about this, right? You come to the queen, you maybe bow, or you... You know, you chest out, you have this pompous kind of face on. I mean, it's just very reverent, pompous. <laughs> Amy gave me a look when I messed up that word. <laughs> Can we edit these things, Carol? Thank you. All right. So here's the deal. You've got to be completely reverent. You have to be someone to be in her presence. And I think about Prince Harry. He's all grown up now. But I imagine when he was young Prince Harry, he probably every once in a while, even though he's a prince, he may have gotten dirty once or twice in his life, right? He looks like that kind of guy. Imagine him running up to Grandma and giving a big old hug to her with his dirty hands. Do you think that was allowed? I like to think it was allowed. Maybe not in front of the cameras, but behind the scenes, I believe that Prince Harry would not have come up to the queen and says, Grandma Queen, can I please give you a hug? I don't think that's how it worked. I believe that he was able to just 
uh, show affection. I believe that he was able to sit in her lap. I believe all these sorts of things. He probably had little nicknames for all these sorts of things. And, and how does that relate to us? It relates like this. You see, if we're not careful, we see Jesus as the high priest like they would have looked at Jesus, the high priest, in the old sacrificial system. You see, the old system's high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would make this sacrifice once a year to atone for all the sins of all the people of Israel. And so as he's going in, he couldn't be sinful. He had to be pure. He had to be bathed. He had to be baptized. He had to be cleansed. And so therefore, he was unapproachable. No one could approach him. No one could be around him for a period of time. And so in their mindset, no one could go to the high priest and have a conversation. No one could go to him and just have just this affection and they could not be intimate with him there was no relationship between the people and the high priest but they were going through his sacrifice and his purity in order to have a relationship with God it was distant they were disconnected but Jesus wants us to understand as he was trying to help them understand I'm coming to you to be completely approachable you see, you can come to me whether you're clean, whether you're sinful, whether you're hurting, or whatever the case may be, you can come to me. And I will go directly to the Father. In fact, we are one. So if you have a relationship with me, you have a relationship with Him. You don't need an appointment. In fact, how, how does that look in Scripture? How do we know that Jesus was approaching? We know this because He's surrounded by this, this huge crowd, and the disciples and he's just walking through this city. And there's this lady who had an issue of bleeding for 30 plus years. And not to get into all that, but what it really meant was she was considered unclean. Not just physically, but she was considered unclean spiritually. She couldn't go into the synagogue. She couldn't worship. She couldn't do the things all the other Christ followers were doing. And so she was so desperate just to have a connection with God and to find healing because she had tried every other means. And I would imagine the Pharisees were constantly condemning her. That there's something wrong with you. That's why. There's something wrong with you. God is punishing you. And so she had this opportunity. She knew there was something different about this Jesus. And so in the midst of a crowd knowing that it broke all protocol and she was risking her very life and everything, she fought through the crowd and what did she do? She simply touched the hem of Jesus' garment and what did Jesus say? Some of my Bible scholars. Did he say who dares touch the holy garment of the Holy One? Is that what he said? Absolutely not. He said, hold up power just left me. Who touched me? And all the stuff was like, are you kidding me? There's everybody's touching you. Everybody wants a piece of you. All these people are saying, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me because they were desperate. And instead of condemning this young lady, what did he do? He complimented her boldness and her faith. And he brought healing to her body. And he brought oneness with her spiritually. He said, you're one of my children now. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Someone who's completely unclean. Wasn't allowed to be part of the church. Yet Jesus welcomes her in. While I believe we should be reverent, we should have a reverent fear of God because He is powerful. And we will be judged. We all seem to understand that we have complete access to our Father. Without reservation, with complete confidence, that when we come to Him in prayer, He listens and He longs to act upon our requests. Let's move on to our notes. Since we have a high priest who can and will empathize with us and welcomes us as we are, let us pray. How do we pray? That God would strengthen our faith, if you're taking notes. Hebrews eleven six says this, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who, pay attention to this, who sincerely seek Him. So let me kind of issue a challenge. We kind of prep our time of, of prayer to kind of end the service. What if we approached every day to do something that requires faith? And I'm not talking about the faith that you get into your vehicle and you love to test the E signal. I mean, how long can you drive? How many miles can you go with that E on there? 
Maybe you have a car that doesn't tell you how many miles, or whatever the case may be. It, you, know, you know that it's on E, and that's not what I'm talking about. That's not the kind of faith I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when's the last time we approach today's guy? I'm going to do something that requires me to completely depend on you. I'm going to stand up for something, or I'm going to stand up for someone, even though I may face a little mocking persecution. I'm going to give of my resources when it stretches me to do so. You see, I'm not just going to give to God when I know it's there. I, what if God calls me to give? What if God calls me to share my resources when it doesn't make sense, it doesn't add up on paper, but I know that God is wanting me to do that? What if God is wanting me to apologize and I'm lacking the faith because I just, I believe I'm right? And you've heard me say this a lot, and I just reinforce it today, is there are times we need to be more concerned about the relationship than we need to be concerned about being right. You see, there are some times in relationship, you're apologizing, even in the back of the mind, you know you're right. But what I would advise you is don't say, I'm sorry, but you know I'm right. Don't do that. It's an empty-handed, passive-aggressive apology. What if? What if there's a strained relationship and God is wanting one person to just take a step forward in humility and say, you know what? We'll work this out later, but for now we need to make this right and I'm going to take the first step toward reconciliation. What if God's wanting me to be vulnerable? What if God is wanting me to pray bigger prayers? What if we've gotten into a rut? Not just as individuals, but we've got to be careful not to get into a rut even as a church. Are we trusting in Him or are we just doing what adds up? Do things that require you to trust God. In fact, things are like this. What we pray about reflects what we believe about God. What we pray about reflects what we believe about God. So what then can you commit to prayer that will require God's power in your faith to be stronger? Think about this, this last week. What if God answered every prayer you prayed last week? He, he answered those this week. How many lottery winners would we have here today? You don't have to come. For, we can talk later. I don't care. Share. If you're going to win it, share. Okay? But, but really, what, what would change in your life? And would you really be spending whatever you prayed for, that raise or that, that position increase, whatever, would it really change the way you live? Would it make your life better or would it just be about others? So that, let's change the prayer then. It's not just about you. What would be different not just in your life, but what would be better outside of your world? Would anything be better? Or, or, or if, have all of our prayers been centered around our circle, our lives, our home, our church community, just us? The people we see, the people we see regularly, the people we know intimately, are all of our prayers just centered around us? And so if all of our prayers were answered from last week to this, would it just be our little world, our little small circle compared to the big world out there, or would something else have changed outside of that. So here's the last line. Let us pray, not only that God would strengthen our faith, but that God would stretch our prayer circle. You see, of course we should be praying for ourselves and the people within our close community, yet we should also be widening the sphere of influence of our prayers to include those beyond our everyday reach. In fact, I love this, this verse in Isaiah 54 too. He says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. He's talking about broaden it. Make it larger. Enlarge your territory. Enlarge your reach. In fact, the message says this, and I'm going to include verse 3 at the end. Clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large. Spread out. Think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive your tent pegs deep, which is to stretch your faith. You're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. Do you love the idea of having more people 
that know Jesus Christ? Are we just content with the people we know knowing Jesus Christ? So I would venture to say that we probably still have people within our reach, within our family, within our co-working group or whatever, that we don't know if they know Jesus as a personal Savior. And it's important that we start there. That Jesus was very clear when he gave us his last message to the disciples and the apostles. He says, start in Jerusalem, right? He said, start where you live, but at some point we've got to spread out. When's the last time we prayed? God, help me to think wider than me. This is what God has stretched me recently. See, for a while, I've been praying on Sunday mornings, praying for not just my peers in ministry and praying for them by name as they preach the gospel in their communities all around the South, but also praying for local pastors that are, that, you know, it's okay for other churches to grow too, right? It's, it's, you know, it's, it's okay for God to bless because if we truly believe that New Hope is the only church who's doing things right, we are greatly mistaken because you have a pastor who has greatly messed up. Okay, And so there's far greater people out there. There's far greater churches out there. There's far greater things going on, not just in Nacogdoches, but beyond this world. You know the largest church in, Ameri- in, in the world is not in America? It's not. It's over in North and South Korea. That's where it is. That's where there are a million people on the register. You imagine caring for that, right? And so all of this that's going on, it's not just about us. And now this community is important, and I'm biased to this. But it's got to be bigger. It's got to be wider. And so recently, God challenged me to stretch my prayer on Monday to say, okay, as we're working, as Carol and I are sitting down and we're thinking about, okay, the week ahead, the month ahead, God has really been driving home a, a word for me recently is praying for margin. Create margin in my schedule. Create margin in my routines. Create margin in my life so that when opportunities come for me to not just minister to people who are in need within our church, but what if there's people outside these walls, outside of our regular touch, that God may need to, may need to reach. And so recently that just happened, just started about a month ago, and all of a sudden a couple weeks ago I was reached out to by someone who, who has influence in a local nursing home. He said, there's this guy who's, who's in our care, his church isn't really ministering him. He's reached out. They're just not doing it. I don't understand that, but that's the way it is. And so he said, they were looking for someone. I thought about you. Will you come and sit and just visit and get to know? You know what? That was one of the great moments recently. We're just sitting down with this guy, and we're just talking scripture. And honestly, he's pretty sharp biblically. I'm like, I'm going to have to bring it when we have these conversations. And I just loved it. And when we left, it was just such a joy. And I left, and I go, thank you, Lord. And I wonder if God had been waiting on that opportunity. What if he'd been waiting on someone just to say, God, I'm open, whatever you have. But what if we're afraid of that? What if that's it? What if we're just comfortable where we are? We're comfortable where we're, what we're doing and who's around us. So God, help make us uncomfortable. This morning, I want to challenge you, not just to strengthen your faith and do something each day or each week if you need to generalize it for a while, that requires you to be a little bit more faithful, that requires a little bit greater level of faith. Witnessing to someone, being involved in a ministry. If we're serving at Glory Game tonight, if you say, I just, the last time I've done something that wasn't just about benefiting me, then we'd love to see you there. Would you bow your heads with me? God, as we just prepare our hearts for this time of prayer this morning, I pray that you just search us, examine us. I mean, I confess to you as I've been working on this message this week that there have been times where I haven't prayed boldly. I've only presented to you small things, and that reflects <laughs> I have little faith at times. And so it'll help me to understand that not only are you approachable, but you are more than able. There's people in our lives that we're, we're hesitant to pray for because we feel like they're so far from you. 
there's ministries that you've already placed on our hearts that we need to be involved in. We're just afraid to bring it up in our prayer life because we know what you're wanting us to do. So God, help us just to be bold and be honest and open ourselves up that we truly come to a place where we're willing to do whatever it takes to reach people. We're really willing to play whatever role, whether it benefits us or if it's merely about ministering. It's about bringing you glory. And that's what you need us to do right now. You need us to be faithful in the opportunities you presented before you're going to present other opportunities for us. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, maybe you want to pray and invite Him into your life. And so before we sing this song of worship and open up this altar prayer, maybe you're here today and you just need to start there.